Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Culture and the SDGs program. We're very, very excited to welcome all the participants and all of our experts who kindly joined us today for the first session of our online program, which will take place today and on the 6th. I see that our participants, we have 14 of, out of 16 of our participants, so I think we're going to give them one last minute to tune in and then we kick off the meeting. And we have a full house with our participants. Welcome back, everyone. It's lovely to uh, have all of you here, although we can't see all the participants right now in the webinar session. We've made sure that uh, we have all of our attention fully directed towards the experts. Um, I'm not going to take any more time because we've had our you know, opportunity to get to know each other. So I'm going to um, introduce our other team member, uh, Pedro, who's here. Say hello, Pedro. He's our facilitator for both the online sessions and for the residency in Istanbul. So you're going to hear a lot from him. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to give the stage to him. Hello, everybody. As we are having participants from all corners of this world, I'm going to say good afternoon, good morning, good evening, and not good night because I hope nobody's going to sleep. <laughs> so uh, it's a really ple real pleasure for me to be here today sharing this great moment with all of you. Uh, as Pravali said, my name is Pedro and I'm originally from Brazil and I've been living in Berlin, Germany since 2015, where I did my MA in International Relations and Cultural Diplomacy. I've been working in this field since 2010 as a consultant, expert, and researcher specialized in the topic of culture, culture and creative industries and local development, sustainable development. Last year, I had the pleasure to write an article about the interconnections of culture to other sectors, using as an example, the cultural sector uh, from where I come from, from Recife, my, my hometown, back home in Brazil. So I've been advocating for the cultural sector to be in connection with other sectors and, and vice versa for quite a long time. And today we have three speakers who are also very, very experienced, experienced in, in advocating and in work towards these connections, towards enhancing creative cross-sectoral collaborations. This is the name for our program today. We will be together today and on the 6th of September online. And very soon we will be also together personally in Turkey, uh, enhancing even more these connections, having even more time to discuss it's really great to remember that uh, this project, it's been supported, you know, it's an initiative supported by the European Union through the Cultural Relations Platform. And it's a project conceived by Culture and Sustainability Lab. This afternoon with us, we have uh, four members of the team. Said Kamal is here with us. We have Alexandra who is here with us. We have Pravali and we have myself. Uh, and before introducing the speakers, I will just recommend everybody to turn the microphone off while the other speaker is talking so that we avoid uh, problems with uh, the presentations. We will be together from uh, Central European time now from two to four. And would be great if everybody could uh, keep uh, the presence here 
till the end because we will have q a sessions and many opportunities to interact so we will have this afternoon the first presentation from dr violeta book she's the curator of eco civilization the former european commissioner and deputy prime minister of the republic of slovenia after dr violeta we will have miss anupama seka she is the director of policy and engagement the international federation of arts councils and cultural agencies and after these two presentations we will open uh, for questions for audience reflections and q a so in the meantime the speakers are talking we encourage everybody to send questions on in, in the chat that will be read after this first set of presentations and q a we will have mr jordi pasquale who is the coordinator of the committee on culture and of the world organization of united cities and local governments uclg and after his presentations we will have another audience reflection and q a session so i would like to welcome dr violeta book who is giving us many reflections on culture, environment, and eco-civilization. I'm particularly very curious to know more about uh, eco-civilization and how this can be connected to the cultural sector. Uh, we know that the cultural sector, through its innate and instrumentalized power, is very connected to other areas. So I would like to open the floor for you, Violeta, and to thank you for, for your participation and uh, to be sharing with us your knowledge and experience. You're very welcome. Thank you very much, Pedro, and thank you to all organizers to give me an opportunity to share some of the thoughts with you uh, with a very um, simple intention that this is just the beginning of our long-lasting conversation uh, because uh, things that I will put forward, uh, I hope to present them as an invitation to you to uh, co-create and think along with the entire community that I currently represent in front of you. So um, the future is uh, in col uh, cross collaboration, the future is in searching for a participatory and collaborative ways of decision making. And I'm sure that we as humans will manage to do so. But allow me also to uh, use uh, a short presentation that I prepared uh, for today's uh, session as a background, uh, just to help me a little bit more focus uh, my thoughts because they can go very broad. It's so much happening these days and the world, all world is trembling and uh, entering this exciting emergence of new uh, cycle. And uh, that's why it's good to stay focused a bit. So first of all, uh, let me set the framework within which I would like to explore this topic of um, sustainability, culture and collaborative actions. Uh, current society is very much uh, under the influence, the global society, I'm not just talking about one particular one, but this I feel it's uh, something we have in common on a global scale, is very much under the influence of the industrial mentality. For the last 300 years, our Western civilization that later on through the different um, exploitations and different imperialistic moves uh, influenced the rest of the world. Uh, it was very much focused on um, industrialization of the world and uh, for that particular uh, goal to be achieved, uh, static structures start to uh, evolve and start to prove to be a hand a very handy tool in order to uh, fulfill uh, the needs that industrialization had. Of course, uh, once you start observing what static structures do to humans, you soon realize that uh, it's a very artificial setup and a framework within which uh, we were pushed to evolve as uh, human beings. Um, so uh, everything around us, um, is in a dynamic state. 
every moment is different than the previous one and nothing repeats itself uh, so we're in this constant unbelievable uh, phase of emergence of new and uh, in order for us to sustain on the long run and in order to sustain in the accordance and in synchronicity with the uh, planet earth uh, i think we need we are invited to step out of the static structures uh, out of this uh, tunnel vision uh, that industrialization uh, needed in order to uh, to expand and that we will find a better way of uh, bringing together all the benefits of technologies um, and, and the industrial mindset. Uh, however, at the same time, give humanity a huge space to continue to evolve as human being and along uh, continue to evolve in the collaboration with the nature around us. Uh, every single day we get uh, warnings that that is probably necessary uh, in order for us to sustain a species. What do we have uh, then available as alternative? Uh, I'm not going to say probably anything new to you, but um, there are many models and many systems uh, that have evolved throughout the centuries and throughout the civilizations that actually do embrace uh, what is happening around us. And I'll just share two of them with you. One is a VUCA principles uh, that uh, really uh, talk about this volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous world that is around us and invite us to find models, processes, ways of collaboration, ways of connecting and collaborating uh, to uh, in a way to embrace these VUCA uh, principles, uh, to really get ourselves, our communities and our teams ready for an uh, predictable, ready for unseen, ready for unknown, not from the position of fear, but from the position of excitement. So uh, you can immediately probably sense that there is a huge difference if you are getting a team ready for a static structure, for a linear organization, for a, a goals, uh, visions, missions, uh, strategies, actions. Um, and that's a completely different mindset than if you invite people into getting together, organizing uh, themselves together in order to address a known. Are you with me on that? Do you feel the excitement? And the same applies to uh, these values that are, of course, evolving around it, which we call Rupta a set of uh, characteristics, which uh, says that everything around us in, is uh, also um, in a way of rapid, unpredictable, often paradox uh, paradoxical, tangled um, relationship. And that is the magic that I'm inviting you into. And that we take a look at the sustainability uh, and the way how to achieve it through these new perspectives. So uh, let's again uh, take a look at what are the options that we have today. In one hand, we're entering a very strange decadency where with our behavior, we're causing more troubles for ourselves than benefits. Yeah, you see that we are entering, the whole world is entering from one crisis to another. If before crisis was uh, every hundred years and then maybe every few decades, now we have them every year, few of them that are affecting global, uh, global uh, population. So on one way we could say, and you see many uh, ideas floating around that they're saying, oh, maybe the humanity is ready to go extinct. Well, how do you feel about that? Huh? I certainly don't want to be in that uh, mind, mindset. Uh, the other um, alternative that has been offered in the last couple of years very with a very strong persuasion, especially for the global multinational IT uh, companies and some selected uh, group of people who think that they rule the world, and they start talking about transhumanism saying, oh, humans are so weak, we have so many uh, pitfalls, we need to improve ourselves uh, with technology, embedded technological components in order for us to survive. And this is how a new species will evolve and continue to co uh, exist on this planet Earth. Well, I'm gonna challenge this seriously. And personally, 
I love technology. I'm a computer engineer. I worked in Silicon Valley for many years. And, you know, I was part of that high tech telecommunication IT world. And um, I love it. But hey, human being is so much more than technology. It's so much more than a square. Uh, we are this unpredictable, uh, inspirational, creative uh, beings, and we are not giving ourselves a chance in a modern society to really evolve, to evolve on our emotional, spiritual, physical, um, uh, on social and, and energy levels. We don't pay attention to that. All we want is to squeeze us in a square box that computers understand. You know, uh, just remember how you feel when you try to use some of these modern digital services where you become a slave of the digital world, entering all the information that before uh, specialized people used to do for you. And there is no kindness and there is no uh, room for a bit of improvisation and adjustment to specific rules that uh, to specific characteristics that you have as a human being. No, you have to be a square. You have to fit in a certain a pattern and otherwise they kick you out and um, i experienced that when i felt into this fault of um of digital world and uh, went through a year and a half through a process to re-establish myself uh, and get all the rights back that i uh, needed so um I'm offering the third path. It's uh, not my, I'm not gonna claim it as my own, even though I started the movement in this direction, but it is. it came from the collective consciousness and I call it eco-civilization. Eco-civilization uh, to be one of possible shared destinations, destinations of the uh, planet in the future. I would even claim that that is probably the ticket for our existence and capacity offering capacity to thrive as human species, as part of this incredible planet Earth, in this incredible natural inhabitant and uh, to be shared with all other species and beings. So this is the framework within which now I'd like to move more deeper into the sustainable development, especially in the role of culture in that. Uh, in the last couple of uh, years, let's say last 20 years, the concept of sustainable development has been very much present, not only on philosophical level or some sort of level of declaration, but we are trying to bring it down on the operational level and try to live it. But that means that we need to readjust and change a lot of habits, a lot of behaviors, a lot of business models in order to really get there. Because for 300 years, we were walking into a different direction, thinking that uh, there is unlimited resources available on this planet Earth, thinking that we can do whatever we want and the nature will embrace it. Oh, guess what? Nature is no longer embracing our behavior. Nature is no longer supporting the, our vision of the world. Is really one step after the other is proving us that we are wrong. You know, the latest uh, incredible disaster, uh, horrible disaster in Pakistan is just one little uh, indication of that. Yeah. So uh, when are we going to learn? When are we going to wake up? Uh, we started to, one of these wake up calls came from the community who believed that we need to go and enter into the circular economy cir uh, phase. So no longer just thinking how much we can use and uh, dispose, but really think in terms of rethinking, redesign, um, reuse, uh, reduce and recycle at the end. But soon we realize that that's not enough because this is not a perfect circle, so that we are invited into also caring for planet Earth. And that's how regenerative development started to gain in its value, to making sure that we understand that how much life is in the soil and that if we don't take care of the soil, if we don't regenerate and keep the diversity going, uh, we will not be able to, uh, to even run the circular economy because there, was, there will be nothing left to run, run it on. And, um, and here is now the density increasing. And I have a huge hope that an eco-civilization puts this as the core of its uh, progressive development is that we join 
successfully. And one hand is donut philosophy that we understand that uh, Earth is limited, uh, empowered by circular economy models, and uh, of course, uh, embraced by the regenerative development, which uh, takes care of also our soil and our, uh, our land. And in this, I ask often myself, what is the role of culture in this? How can culture help us to, uh, to drive the change that deeply in our hearts, deeply in our souls, we all feel, but somehow in the physical world, we are so trapped with the old mentality and old structures and old ways of uh, understanding the, the, the options and possibilities that we just are somehow stuck. So I do believe that the role of culture uh, is the one that shows the way of life. And it's that smart, wise woman or man who uh, survives centuries and really uh, embraces what works for people. So I do believe that uh, the culture has this, um, it it's, is this medium for expression and communication. And of course, it gives us a chance to have our own identification, to understand the connection between land and uh, society, city, village, uh, the environment, and that those are very different in different parts of the world. And culture embraces all that and brings forward as a help to our own personal development. So uh, the role of culture is really to give us this shared experience that uh, it holds the space within which we can evolve, we can clarify our thoughts, we can exchange our points of view and develop this group consciousness. So for me, that is a repository of knowledge and wisdom. So understanding that right next to this culture is an incredible tool and enabler of change, which is art. Art is the one that challenges the, the, the current points of view. Uh, art is the boldness we need to expand our cultural uh, identification, to expand our cultural point of view beyond the boundaries that we created for ourselves. That is this naughty child that always asks questions that uh, are a bit disturbing, but because art has so much freedom in its spirit, it, we are tolerant and allow it to lead and then we very slowly walk behind it. It's really the space where collective dreams evolve. And if any time today, we need this space for collective dreaming. So art and culture together are really important for this uh, sustainable move that we are trying to uh, manifest. And we have so much trouble with it. So many hurdles from the old mindset, from the old static structures are on the way. And if anyone, art and culture can help us to do this first inner expansion, because if we don't do our inner expansions, how are we gonna expand the spaces and, 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 and structures around us that we create? Uh, it also expands our sensory capacities so we can feel more. And at the same time, it expands our cognitive processes that we can actually take on board complex challenges, complex systems, and don't uh, underestimate them, and don't try to find the short uh, ways through, but embrace these cognitive uh, complex models and solve them, understand them, work with them, and with the sensory capacity, also transform them uh, in the way that we need for our future lives. So in short, art and culture, I believe, are a strong vehicle towards a sustainable world, a tool for peaceful transformation towards uh, eco-civilization. And at the same time, I see them as this beautiful melting pot of all behaviors and beliefs and bad for hidden social clusters that evolve uh, in this fruitful land of art and culture. And uh, I really like this uh, article, you might want to uh, take a look at it, uh, that says our big discovery in this uh, uh, in, in, is that every network has a hidden social cluster. 
in the outer edge, so at the edge, that is perfectly poised to increase the spread of a new idea by several hundred percent. The social clusters are ground zero for triggering tipping points in the society. So my invitation to you is find those clusters, be part of them, uh, embrace them and uh, help them to expand and be the change that you wanna see in the world. So uh, my final thought again to reinforce um, the message that you are passing today as well is collaboration and cross-sectorial uh, uh, co-creation is the key for sustainable future. So let's be brave, let's reach out, let's bring all the borders, all the walls down and just enjoy this beautiful life that is so much well described by uh, VUCA and RUPTA uh, principles. So thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to share my thoughts with you. And I, I'm gonna stick around and uh, listen to the rest and maybe at the end there will be some additional questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Violeta. Really, really great to have you at the beginning to remind us in a way the broader sense of culture and the broader role culture plays in our society as a tool of transformation, a tool of sensibility, a tool that can be used to a more systematic change. Yeah? And I think now we will have Anupama Seka who is going to talk with us to us and with us about some reflections uh, on international cultural policy. And I, I'm also very curious to, 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 to check with her, to see through her presentation, her perspectives on how culture has been treated uh, uh, in terms of international cultural policies. And if these dimensions, for instance, that Violeta brought are embedded to the, the, the policy perspective, to the policy ideas that we have circulating around the world. So Anupama, very nice to see you again and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pedro. Pleasure to, to see you again after so many years, uh, at least virtually, if not in person. I really enjoyed the, the ideas uh, that were just shared. And um, there are a few overlaps and a few areas uh, where I think there are synergies to explore. Uh, what I thought I would talk about today really is looking at the last 20 years of what is called international cultural policy. Uh, what are the agendas? What are also the tensions? who are the big players, and to, to really leave our audiences with more questions than information. So that's the, the approach that I hope to take. And uh, I hope there'll be some time to have a, a conversation as well. So when, when we actually say international cultural policy, we could be talking about two very different things. On one hand, we're talking about the whole evolution of norms, frameworks that are articulated by international organizations or which are considered good practice internationally. And I'm sure UNESCO comes to mind and we will talk about how UNESCO, what are its priorities in terms of international cultural policy. And then on the other hand, we're looking at international cultural policy from our own countries and nation states because uh, Different countries and different regions have their own cultural policy stands, measures, and, and priorities. And how do these two intersect? And what are, uh, what's are what been happening in the last two decades is something I'm going to quickly run through. Let's look at the, the whole notion of international frameworks, norms uh, that many countries in the world have signed up to. Of course, it you know we're looking to, to see what UNESCO does. Uh, UNESCO has six culture conventions, so to speak. Um, I think most countries in the world are member states of UNESCO, and uh, they are signatories to some or all of these conventions. And in some ways, these are international frameworks that then bind these countries to take 
action on the ground and to also translate some of these ideas, concepts and notions into national legislation and strategies. Looking at these, the list of the six, I think one thing would immediately stand out for everyone, that five out of the six are largely related with the notion of heritage, of cultural heritage, whether, inter, whether tangible, whether intangible, whether we're looking at natural heritage or cultural or built heritage. Uh, and also, as is currently in the news, the whole notion of uh, cultural property and cultural heritage in times of war and conflict. Uh, and then the most recent of UNESCO's culture conventions from 2005, so that's about 15, 16 years ago, is the one related to the protection and promotion of the diversity of cultural expressions. This is a quite sort of a wordy uh, phrase, but what we're really talking about is the diversity of artistic expressions, about the different films that are made, the different genres of music that is out there. And the timing of this convention, 2005, will give you a sense of of where it came from. This is when the era of globalization had just begun. So it's it comes to us in that context. And then we spoke about international cultural policy also being something very national and very different. And one of the big debates in the, in the last 15 years has been the whole notion of cultural diplomacy and cultural relations. Uh, even today, there is cultural diplomacy, of course. This is how countries bilaterally or multilaterally uh, stay connected, stay engaged, build goodwill among each other's publics and audiences. Uh, but we also increasingly hear about the shift from cultural diplomacy to cultural relations because uh, nation states are not anymore the only actors in this universe. Non-state actors, whether they are big international NGOs uh, or big national NGOs with influence, formal and informal networks, foundations, all manner of funders uh, have an important role uh, to play in the world of cultural relations. And the, the organization that su is supporting this, this project is also has the word cultural relations in its phrase and again speaks to the notion that there are different actors at arm's length directly within government that are working uh, around these issues. And the big shift that, that we have seen is really from the whole notion of showing and telling, this is my culture, uh, have a look. It's more now about collaboration, co-creation, uh, mutual cultural practice. And this notion of collaboration, whether between countries working in arts and culture or even between sectors, is something that has now been completely uh, mainstreamed. And um, for many countries, when we look at their international cultural policy, it's definitely about cultural diplomacy, but in many cases also about cultural relations. And we see in the last two decades uh, how the work of organizations such as, for instance, the British Council or the Goethe Institute has changed on the ground. These are vast networks that operate in many parts of the world, uh, which at one time really focused on bringing the best of British arts or of German arts to other countries and present them. But, but their work has in the last two decades changed dramatically to really make it something that is of course also about the UK or about Germany, but really also about the local context in which they work. It's much more about co-creation and this is a huge shift that, that we see. Uh, if we look, if we generally look at what national priorities uh, we could find in different parts of the world, uh, we hear a lot about intercultural dialogue and global peace building. We're also hearing more and more about how countries are really keen to internationalize the cultural sector of their own countries. Uh, in, in some cases, particularly in the you know in the global north or in developed countries, we hear the word export of cultural goods and services, and we'll speak about this later. And in many parts of the global south or developing countries, uh, there is a lot of focus on accessing forms of international cooperation. In some cases, it's aid, it's technical assistance, uh, but, but also other forms of solidarities, including from within the global south to really develop and strengthen their, their own cultural sectors so that in the long horizon, they can also export cultural goods and services. So in the last two decades, these have become cultural policy priorities for many countries. Today, I just want to interrogate two key phrases that are inescapable. These are two sort of uh, looking at international agendas for cultural policy in two catchwords. One is cultural diversity 
and the other is cultural and creative industries. And those of you who may be familiar with uh, UNESCO's 2005 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions uh, would be familiar with the interrogation, the exploration of, of these two uh, terms. Uh, when we just hear the phrase, uh, phrase cultural diversity, um, 20, 25 years ago, it was really something that we, we take as a given of the human condition. There is diversity in the world, there's cultural diversity. Uh, but today, uh, in, in the world of international cultural policy, I think cultural diversity has become some sort of a, a, a you know, it's, it's a jargon that really indicates, it, it, we're speaking about globally shared normative, like a meta-narrative. And this notion of cultural diversity began around 2005 with the, the last UNESCO convention. And as I was saying earlier, it was really a response to globalization and the perceived sort of worries and concerns and anxieties in many parts of the world about the growing homogenization of, of cultural ideas around the world and the need, therefore, for various countries, regions and contexts to protect their own cultures and their own artistic expressions. And uh, conventions such as this really provide nation states with that. Uh, it gives them that sovereign right to shape their own cultures and to protect and to promote them. The other phrase that we've been hearing from the late 90s is the notion of cultural and creative industries. When I was growing up in, in India in the 80s, we spoke about the cultural sector and what we meant was the non-profit cultural sector, whether we are talking about the big museums which send their artifacts on exhibitions around the world or whether we, whether we speak about small performances in really small grassroots venues. Uh, but I think today the notion of cultural and creative industries has become the dominant uh, paradigm in Western cultural policy discourse and increasingly in international cultural policy. I think this is a concept familiar to many. Uh, what we're really talking about are, are those industries where the, you know, the notion of individual talent, of individual creativity uh, is, is, is central. Uh, where human creativity becomes the source of all these cultural goods and services, whether they are films, whether they are visual arts that are presented in big biennales, whether it's music or a musician performing uh, across the world or selling their music through streaming services. The critical thing here to, to keep in mind is the notion that when we're talking about the industry side of things, we're talking really about countries making policies that will help the production, promotion, and really the commercialization of goods and services. And hence the whole notion of exporting our cultural goods and services and of, of trade, of reaching the public and of reaching a market. Uh, and so in this sense, when we're talking about cultural policy or international cultural policy, the notion of cultural, we have to remember, has also become therefore a key economic policy issue. So we, we see that this transversality, that culture is no, no longer only about culture, it's also about very much about economics. And, and therefore, this, this whole notion of cultural and creative industries and how it's been mainstreamed in international uh, policy, cultural policy, we see uh, the, the 2005 Convention of UNESCO was a key milestone uh, in international cultural policy because it began to see cultural goods and services, whether they are films or uh, you know, big uh, exhibitions that tour the world, as both cultural and economic, that the cultural goods have this whole dual nature. On one hand, it's produced uh, with the creativity of individuals, it has certain symbolic meanings, texts and subtexts, but on the other hand, can also be economic. We, we buy tickets to watch the, the cinema and that generates revenues. We, we pay for our music streaming services and therefore there are international frameworks uh, that can help countries to boost the side of things, whether domestically or internationally. And this whole notion of supporting the creative ecosystem nationally and also exporting one's cultural goods and services has really become mainstream in international cultural policy. Uh, this year, UNESCO put out some global trends in creativity and just having a quick look at these trends will, will give us a sense what is emerging as critical in international cultural policy. We're talking about the contribution of culture and creativity to GDP. We're talking about how many people are employed in the sector. At the same time, we're seeing the public investment uh, to subsidize culture, to invest in culture has also been declining in the last 10 years. So, so we're seeing two sides. Uh, we're seeing the whole notion of exports of cultural goods and services has since 2005 to, to, to 2019 doubled in value. 
the digital realm and the economic value of the digital realm has, has really become absolutely critical. Uh, but at the same time, the people who produce all of this, the, the musicians, the artists, the arts managers, uh, they're all facing very, very precarious conditions because they're very much operating in the informal economy. And this is one of the, the critical tensions uh, that are yet to be resolved. Uh, the notion of trade, of the flow of cultural goods and services, again, has been mainstreamed. Developed countries in the world are still exporting a lot more of their films, of their performing arts. Um, global In global trade, increasingly, uh, we're seeing the notion of cultural goods and services becoming very, very common. Uh, there is this notion borrowed from uh, the world of trade, which is the notion of preferential treatment, because we're we're all aware that countries in the global south, developing countries, uh, have do, are not able to compete as well as developed countries in the global trade, and which is why we see the dominance uh, from the developed countries. And therefore, uh, in conventions like the 2005 convention, uh, there is the notion that developed countries will give preferential treatment to developing countries which means that you may you you perhaps would offer them tax incentives you will uh, provide them easier uh, visa for their artists to come and and perform so you provide a whole range of uh, preferential special treatment to them uh, in order uh, that there is more equity in the cultural exchanges uh, that we see and and again here we see the preferential treatment though it's though it has been spoken about in the last 15 years though it's available as this fantastic mechanism that could be used to promote the cultural sector in the developing countries is something that is still very, very rarely uh, used. And the, the last few years with, with COVID, uh, I think has definitely brought the cultural and creative sectors, particularly in developing countries, to a sort of uh, crisis or existential mode. And uh, jobs have been lost. And if, if you take the Global South, uh, very many artists in the Global South also rely on international tours or, or going for uh, opportunities abroad as a way, not only for exposure, but also to get a substantial part of their livelihood. And all of that has been uh, radically changed with, uh, in the last few years. And we a lot of people have left the sector. So we see that on one hand, there is that great push to see the cultural and creative sectors as an important uh, part of building back better. There has been all these conversations about uh, all of us in lockdown being stuck at home and binging on Netflix and using music and you know enjoying the work of artists to, to simply to survive uh, the boredom, the, the sadness, the being locked up at home. So people are have been in the last few years consuming more and more cultural content, uh, largely digitally, uh, and yet the, the people who make this content are, are leaving the sector, losing their jobs and struggling to make ends meet. So what does this tell us really about the big challenges in international cultural policy? Uh, I'll come to that soon, but it's, it's really about, is there enough recognition of, uh, of, of, of the arts, of artists, of the cultural and creative sector as a, a sector, if not an industry, as a profession? This is a big challenge in, in many parts of the world, particularly because uh, people are still working in the informal economy, many of them without contracts, without any standard pay. Uh, uh, another big debate, and this is the big emerging sort of debate, uh, in, in cultural policies about culture being considered a global public good. Uh, this year, uh, UNESCO, it puts out uh, an analysis of, of trends uh, on cultural and creativity every few years, and they are now positioning culture as a global public good. And the UN, as part of its common agenda, which it put out last year, completely left out culture, but is beginning to again have conversations uh, whether we should look at culture as a global public good. And this has become a very, you know, this this debate is very relevant now because we've just come out of COVID and there's so many conversations about uh, the resilience and cohesion of society was also because people had access to, to culture. Uh, but the big debates now are, does everyone understand what is a global public good? Some people argue that it should be a common good and not a public good. <clears throat> if it is a public good, then 
Are we positioning it against the market driven side of things? So these are, I think, the big debates that will that will happen in the in the coming years as the UN also pushes for its new our common agenda, which came out last year. Later this month in uh, Mexico, ministers of culture from from all over the world are uh, going to gather for a very historic meeting called Mundia Cult. The last time such a gathering happened was 40 years ago in 1982. And so this will be a very, very important moment for international cultural policy as well as for international cooperation in the area of arts and culture to revisit many of the, the challenges, the post-COVID concerns in the sector, uh, as well as really to, to pick up on some of the big tensions and realities. And one of this is that we are still, different people understand culture in very many different ways. Uh, it's everything from ways of life, uh, our beliefs, to what now we see as the cultural and creative industries, which is a sector, which is a, a really a, a, pr a profession. So we'll, this is a big uh, challenge we would, that we would still have to, to resolve before we, before we are able to, at the international level, say culture, let's consider culture a global public good and allocate the kind of investment and resources it needs. What do we mean when we say culture? Then there is the big issue of the arts as a profession. There are people working in this sector in many parts of the world. Uh, most people working in this sector work as freelancers, so they don't have a regular employer. If you're working on a film set, for instance, you work for two months and there's no job for two months, and then you get another short-term contract. And when you have contracts like this, you're not covered usually for health or social security. So you're really lost in those, in those gaps. So a lot of the challenges also comes with uh, the, the very unique and specific needs of the cultural sector. Is it understood by policymakers? Uh, for instance, people who, who travel for several months and perform all over the world uh, are usually sometimes often taxed multiple times in different countries. Uh, so these are big challenges that need to be uh, resolved if we are really talking about cultural creative industries of, of the export of goods and services of really building a world in which we would have access to diverse artistic expressions. That today we're talking about international cultural policy, but as, as, as I was saying earlier, non-state actors are playing a um, big role since globalization. I think cultural relations is no longer only led by countries, it's also led by very many other sorts of actors. So there's a sort of a de-territorialized transnational context in which cultural exchange is taking place. And this is sometimes really beyond the reach of national policy. So how is international cultural policy responding to this sort of complex connectivity and all these new players uh, that are now in the, uh, uh, you know, operating? And last but not the least, to come back to this notion of market-driven culture and public goods. So on one side, we have the for-profit cultural and creative industries, which have a very, very strong economic value on top of their symbolic or cultural value. And then in many parts of the world, there is the tension between the not-for-profit cultural sector, which in many parts of the global north uh, uh, is often subsidized through, through public grants and remains the principal focus of, of cultural policy. So where do the two meet? And a large part of the even the for-profit cultural creative industries across uh, the global south are really micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. So if you want to boost their, uh, you know, have export those cultural goods and services, then it requires a very, very special set of, of measures. So these are some of the unresolved tensions, and these will also be very much on the agenda of uh, this big Mundia cult historic gathering that will happen at the end of this month in, in Mexico. So it's a very exciting time uh, for international cultural policy. And uh, I think one of the, the other big, big conversations around the public good uh, issue is about finding a place for culture in the post-2030 uh, agenda. You know, that culture was really left out of the 2030 agenda uh, as a separate specific goal, though it was embedded in very many other goals, but I think the momentum is very, very strong to have culture as a goal in the post-2030 agenda. And I know uh, that my dear friend and colleague, Shori Pasquale, is going to speak uh, very much to this issue in the next presentation. So that's also one of the big cultural policy uh, debates of our time. So for those of you who are interested, I would say that keep your eyes open for the results that will come out of the Mundia Cult Conference and see uh, where have we come in the 
last 20, 30 years and what will be the sort of the next, the agenda for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anupama. Thank you for your critical reflections and for your courage as usual to talk about the tensions and this balance or imbalance between the market driven perspective and the other values that culture has to to us to our society i don't know about you my dear participants but i have many questions for the participants so i hope you also have questions for them there are two ways that you can uh, ask and direct your questions. You can either write a question in the Q&A chat option, or you raise your hand and you open your mic and perhaps your camera as well, and you can ask your question directly. We will enjoy the next 15 minutes having this exchange we currently have just for everybody's information 41 participants which is a great number of people online here with us and we have one question here from virginia san felice i hope i pronounced it correctly virginia it's one of our selected participants she's from italy and i believe her question and please correct me virginia if i'm wrong it's uh, towards Violetta, because she asked in what is Violetta, in your opinion, the main challenge of the eco-civilization? Well, thank you very much for the uh, question. Uh, there are many. Uh, I can't even start naming them. Uh, but if we got stuck with uh, possible obstacles and uh, challenges uh, in a negative sense, we would get lost. So instead, we just keep collaborating and tap into the emergence and see what's emerging and supporting what gains the confidence of a collective approval. Uh, so, um, I mean, opportunities, if you mean challenges in a positive way, uh, are incredible. I mean, that we bring back the dignity to humanity, that we can reconnect with the natural laws and processes and uh, fine tune our lives to this incredible planet, which is unique in the whole constellation of universe. I'm convinced that there is no such a thing as uh, planet Earth anywhere else. It would be even nicer, could be slightly different, but there is no such a thing as planet Earth. So let's show some respect to this incredible planet and uh, all the diversity it holds. So, uh, sorry, uh, come on board, help us to uh, to, to co-create uh, this. Uh, we are now in 30 different countries. Uh, uh, you will see, I mean, if you check the ecocivilization.eu page, you will see uh, incredible events now happening 24 hours for humanity. Uh, connect a -thon and things like that. Uh, so no promotion here. It's a completely volunteering project. No uh, finances at the back, just self-organizing uh, self uh, network. But um, as I said, challenges uh, in a sense of negative sense are obstacles. So the best way to overcome them is to engage and keep looking for solutions that you want to see in the world. Uh, and opportunities, uh, tap into the mergers, don't try to judge or expect, but constantly tap into the mergers and see what gains the collective consciousness uh, approval. Thank you very much, Violeta. We have one participant here who also sent a comment. Uh, this one was written to Anupama. Uh, Tino Muda Daphne Gora. Uh, it's written here. I'm so glad, Anupama, for you addressing the policy issues surrounding culture and creative industry, which have been for a long time not really appreciated on their role in economic development of nations. And then uh, there is an introduction. I'm a policy analyst from Africa, and these are real issues which needs to be domesticated and sensitized at country levels. Thank you. Uh, another question here in the Q&A, it's from Marta, who wrote a question to Violeta. 
do you know any good practice benchmarks about eco civilization, for instance, institutions, events, or etc.? Eco civilization as a movement and expanding community has been around since May 2020. So, uh, no, we don't have any governance models overseeing it yet. Uh, first, we're focusing in collaboration also with a great global movement, G100, uh, led by my colleague, Dr. Uh, Harbin Aurora from India, uh, where Ecosivization is one of these 100 projects. Uh, and we are yet to see what could be the measurements of success, really, because we don't want to fall into a trap of current um, measurement systems. Uh, and when I say that, I don't think that everything is bad, don't get me wrong, but uh, we are yet to see how to really measure that. Currently, what I'm uh, trying to see is how many people join in, how many countries are willing to open their notes, or we call them wings, uh, and uh, how many projects are emerging. And in not even full two years time of operations, we, we have some incredible uh, solutions already merging out, uh, year of Ubuntu, year of circular economy, books are coming out, new IT platforms are being formed, uh, and not that by one person, of course, uh, but this is what is coming out of the emergence. Uh, so I'm very excited, and maybe in 10, 20 years time, we'll be able to look back and see, oh, these were the triggering points, this is something it's worth um, observing. These are the leverage points that we should observe in the future. But at this point, I have to say, no, we don't have any. We're just looking at the dynamic and the congestions that are happening within the network. Thank you. I see there were two hands up and now there is only one. So I will stick with the one which is still up. Is from Odongo Solomon, who is also a participant of our program, and I will allow you to talk. And I hope that we can hear your voice, or perhaps hear your voice and see your face, Odongo, as well. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Odong Solomon, uh, the founder of the Tumani African Knowledge Center, Pan African company that is committed to make sure that Pan African values inform economic solutions uh, to the continent. I have a question to Albam uh, from uh, the presentation. First of all, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. I've been really following uh, so much because I'm so passionate about culture. And uh, to just be specific, where I've had my expertise in the African culture. And uh, most times I feel uh, uh, there is a much historical perception uh, or perspectives about uh, culture, especially when we talk about Africa, to only that is a bit narrowed down to crafts, uh, paintings, and, 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 and to mention. Uh, but yet it's actually much more beyond that uh, to uh, more to values, uh, the way of life and also the belonging uh, to the community as, as people in Africa. How do we deal uh, with this, the historical uh, perspective of culture? Uh, how do we deal? Uh, how do we deal with this? I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Pedro, was that addressed to me? I lost a bit of the audio. Yeah, yeah, it was addressed to you. Could you could you hear or shall? Uh, if you could just like pa paraphrase, because I heard parts of it, but I, I I lost it at the at the end. Odongo, could you briefly ask it again? Yeah, sure. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yes, yes, I hear you oh. well now, please. All right, thank you. So uh, briefly, I was asking, how do we deal with historical percept uh, perceptive, uh, perceptive of culture? 
especially when we talk about Africa, that uh, there has been a narrow, to in my own uh, uh, understanding, there's been a narrow perception of, of culture, of African culture, to only uh, to crafts and paintings, yet there is much more beyond that. Yes, absolutely. I think there's, you're very, very right that, uh, for instance, the association of crafts, uh, of heritage crafts with, with Africa, but I think the, the reality is, is changing dramatically and there are very many fantastic examples from, from across the African continent where countries have taken, for instance, measures such as uh, having local quota for their own music on, on radio stations. Uh, so you have to play 50% of the music on the radio station has to be local music, whether from the specific country or from the, the region and not just from, from outside. Uh, there have been special streaming services that have been built that only cater, for instance, to African music. This is because uh, there is that concern that in the, the big uh, platforms where there is monopoly, that there is no space for music from some parts of the world. And which is why that we don't hear about uh, contemporary creativity from, from parts of Africa and our association sometimes are with things that we know from 20, 30, 40 years, which have their own value, but there's also other things coming out. So uh, I would say that there are several measures that countries are taking, whether at the policy level, making legislation or setting up strategies like, like quotas. There's also a lot of work being done uh, by the civil society themselves to mainstream or to really make uh, contemporary creativity visible. Uh, the other debate is, is also about uh, the big biennales in the world. How many artists from Africa, for instance, do they showcase? Uh, how many curators are from, let's say, the African continent? I think these are now being tracked much more systematically. And if you pick up a, a report such as UNESCO's 2022 Global Report, they see how things have gone in the last decade. And, and we see that it is shifting indeed, both in terms of visibility, representation and, and space. But I think it's a, it's a long battle. It's, it's not going to change overnight. And this is why international cultural policy is important. If countries across the world have signed up to conventions like the 2005 UNESCO convention where they say that we will provide easier visa, we will provide free visa, we will open our market in, in Europe or North America to artists from Africa to come and, and present their movies, to come and present diverse sort of expressions, uh, they need that has to be translated into action. And I think the presence of international cultural policy and frameworks gives us the opportunity both at the national level and also for civil society to, to advocate. Uh, and that's really the beauty of, of using these, these instruments. Uh, I would say change is definitely happening, uh, but a lot more needs to be done. And even private players such as Netflix, for instance, are beginning to, to make that change. They have special uh, categories, awards for uh, this recently one that I saw for the Arab world, women filmmakers from the Arab world uh, to be given money to, to, to tell their own stories. And I think these kind of initiatives from the private sector are also coming, but all of this needs us to, to push to negotiate. Without that, it's, it's not going to happen, but I would definitely say it is happening. I also want to take the, the opportunity to, to, to quickly respond to what Daphne, the policy analyst from uh, Africa had, had shared and which Pedro shared. Though culture and cultural goods and services are not only about purely about their economic value, I think it's important that to, to definitely state that it is, it is also about economic value. In many parts of the world, if our ministries of culture are to give some attention to the cultural and creative sectors, often the way to begin that conversation is really by saying, do you know this has economic value? It's not just, you know, you're not just subsidizing it. There are returns, there, are, there is economic value in many ways. So that becomes the point at which to start the conversation. And again, here, I would say the business side of things, the for-profit side of things is not often discussed enough. Uh, on the African continent, for instance, I think there are so many creative businesses, particularly working in areas such as fashion, largely working informally. And it's only in the last three, four years that you begin to see reports, including from organizations like the International Labor Organization, uh, African Development Bank, really providing things like access to financing. Among all the startups on the African continent, 
the creative businesses have the least access to capital, to financing, to loans, because banks are risk averse. And they're like, but this is a creative business. So what collateral do I have? And we see now interesting examples, let's say from, from Morocco, from South Africa, where governments are setting up guarantee funds that help creative businesses actually gain access to capital. So I think change is coming. And this notion of economic value is, is, a, is an important one to highlight to, to begin uh, the conversations. But it, I think we have to also be always very careful not only to reduce cultural goods and services to their pure economic value, because I think there's more there. Culture has much more social impact as well. And I think that needs to be a part of the conversation, but we also need to be able to measure the social impact because evidence is, is really critical if we're going to go to policymakers. I'll give the floor back to you, Petro. Thank you, Anupama. So given the time, I will get the two final questions for now. And the first one comes from Li Huang. She's also one of our participants from China, somebody working quite a lot with AR and VR, and she's addressing her question to Violeta, asking, how do you envision the eco-civilization to come to reality? Many people who are older generations and are in positions of power, but they are not concerned about the long-term sustainability since they will not live to endure the consequences of ecosystem collapse. Some of the younger generations have the motivation, but have little power in the major decisions. There are also large percentage of world population, which is struggling for survival and have little ability to even hear the paradigm. Thank you very much. Very well structured uh, question. Um, I wish I had more time uh, to respond very systematically, but there are lots of uh, right uh, challenges in this question. But overall, uh, civilizational paradigm shift cannot happen overnight. It cannot happen in a week. It cannot happen in a month. It cannot happen in 10 years. But uh, it's like a wave. So uh, it, uh, it's uh, inviting uh, aware people who are aware what is really going on, what is really the impact of the uh, human race on, on this planet. And, and those that are aware can uh, really get into action. If you're not aware of the challenges, you cannot get into action. So um, I believe that participatory modeling and a constant... Uh, the uh, increase in density of engagements in collaborations in across uh, collaboration in connectivity among different networks will steer these waves and they start very small and you know that all the big changes always happened in a hidden uh, corners of social uh, structures where uh, they slowly start growing 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 until um, there is no way to go back anymore because the whole uh, base has already transformed and uh, those that are currently in power uh, suddenly realize that there is nobody behind them but that's how the real evolutionary change happens and I'm encouraging you just to keep bringing those that feel that want to be uh, engaged in the, this um, re-engineering of our society to keep dreaming because collective dreaming ch make a change and then together we'll manifest. Uh, as I said, I mean, 24 hours of humanity will be 24 hours of co-creation around the globe on all continents coming together in different time zones on specific topics. And it will be a proof of concept. Um, we're tapping into the emergence. We don't know yet what the solutions are, but I have all the confidence that uh, um, the emergence will deliver them. That's why we don't have, like uh, somebody asked, benchmarking. Who should we benchmark ourselves with if there, this doesn't exist yet? Uh, so we need to trust in this uh, individual creativity and collective awareness and consciousness that will deliver uh, good results for us all. So um, come and see. You'll see it's a very concrete projects are happening. People are doing very concrete stuff and then they come and they they check, they check them against others. Uh, they see what's going, uh, what is uh, 
uh, bringing even higher level of awareness and attention uh, and more networks connect with each other. And that's how the whole wave gets created, uh, especially young people who have no experience with static structures and, and really static um, ways of addressing the challenges. Uh, they are our big hope and uh, we need to follow them as well and give them space that they can be what they believe they have in their uh, mind and in their heart, not to tell them to connect to what we came up with. So this is another element of engaging with the youth to hold the space for them to emerge, not to tell them where and, and which way to emerge. Thank you, Violeta. I see that many people are now asking questions and one advice for the person who is raising the hand, uh, please write your question in the Q&A option so that speakers can see your questions and write directly to you. Your question will be seen by everybody as well as the answer from the expert. So I will get the last question here, uh, and I will address this one to Anupama because I see that Anupama is already answering a few questions uh, in the Q&A. Uh, there is one question from Isneha from, uh, 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 from India, who is already getting her answer through written Ming. So I will jump to the question written by Nadia. Uh, who's asked, how can we work with policy makers, legislative bodies, etc., so we can push forward effective policies, legislations, and normativity? This is the last question for now to, to, to you, Anupama, and after that, we'll move on with Jordi Pasquale. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, we can keep answering on, on the chat even as uh, we continue to the next presentations, right, so that we can respond to a few of them. Uh, I think Nadia's uh, question is, is important because it, it it raises the question of what role for, for civil society, what role for, for artists or even for the public to get engaged with policymaking. Uh, I think one of the critical uh, things that has happened in the last 10 to 20 years is this notion of participatory governance. that People, uh, especially uh, those in the cultural sector, have a say in cultural policy making. Different countries are at different levels at which this uh, they have realized or they've built up mechanisms where this has become possible. Uh, in in some countries, for instance, in Europe, there are regular consultations with civil society. So government reaches out to you, and then you you're able to have the conversation. In other parts of the world, there is really not much space for this, but. Uh, one of the ways in which this can be done is, is really one to harness if, for instance, let me take the example of India. India is a signatory to the 2005 Convention of, of UNESCO, which really calls for participatory governance as part of policy making. Uh, there is a report that all countries, including India, for instance, has to submit to UNESCO every four years on what they are doing to support culture and creativity, what policies. And that report uh, for the last uh, 10 years has to be written in consultation with civil society. So mechanisms are already in place where civil society has to be engaged. So one of the ways in which, uh, you know, uh, civil society can start getting engaged is by really looking at what mechanisms exist. In some countries, it may be advanced. In others, it might be basic. But the first step is to be aware what mechanisms exist, what frameworks has your country already signed up to. And then, because there, there is no fight. You can, you can already step in and make your contribution. In other cases where those mechanisms do not exist, I think that's where the whole role of, of advocacy, and this is where civil society from different parts of the world, which are which have similar contexts, for example, like within the global south, should start talking to each other. Instead of each of us in our silos trying 50 things and then it takes you 20 years to make headway, there have to be much more exchange on what works, what doesn't work, and then you you begin to build, build systems where you, you, slow, you slowly push forward. But I think the first step is to tap on existing uh, mechanisms where the country is obliged to consult civil society and then to make yourself heard in that space. 
And the second is to really network with civil society across the world, not only at your national level, but also making your voice heard, for instance, in UNESCO, where there are spaces for civil society to speak up. Anyone can register who belongs to civil society to, to certain networks and can speak uh, at that international fora in front of uh, multiple governments when they are discussing certain issues. So, so network, find out what's there uh, and, and, and begin uh, by taking those first steps where spaces have already been created uh, for you. I'll drop a couple of uh, links where you can find more practical information uh, on the chat uh, where, where you can start making these, these steps. And I'll take the rest of the questions. I'll respond to them online as we continue our conversations. Thank you, Anupama. Just a quick uh, reminder about our activity today. We will have now Mr. Jordi Pasquale presentation, and then after he present his presentation, we have a Q and A uh, to him, and we kindly ask to everybody to pay attention on his presentation as well. Uh, and also, in the meantime, he's presenting to already think about the questions. Okay, so that we read them in the logical sequence. Uh, so, Mr. Jordi Pasquale, who is also a long-time friend, who is a coordinator you know, of the Committee on Culture of the World Organization of United Cities and Local Governments, UCLG, based in Barcelona, and he's going to talk, to give us an overview of the Culture 23rd Go Global Campaign and Go Campaign, now, who is, that is something he's been involved with for many years already. So Jordi, you're welcome, the floor, it's all yours. We have taken you three minutes, don't worry, these three minutes will be added to you, so you will have your time sustained. Three minutes. You are very accurate, but uh, don't worry. I can I can manage and adapt. Uh, thank you very much, Pedro, for this invitation. Uh, also to Pravali and all the all the team. Delighted to share this uh, meeting with Anupama. Hello, and with Violeta. A pleasure to have uh, heard your your presentation too. Um, I, I had intended to to introduce you what uh, we in in United Cities and local governments are doing, and especially our participation in the global Culture 2030 Goal campaign. I, I sent uh, a PowerPoint, but now I hesitate uh, if I have to, to show it. Uh, let me try to, to begin. Uh, and perhaps at the very end, uh, I will I will enjoy uh, sharing with you some some slides, uh, even if mm, they are past, uh, they are uh, shown uh, to you fast. Uh, let me begin with the place of culture in sustainable development, something that Violeta has addressed uh, explicitly also in, in the consideration of ANUPAMA. Um, we are known to have promoted the idea that culture needs to be considered the fourth pillar of sustainable development. And we are more and more convinced that this is an interesting approach. Not perfect, not the solution to everything, but certainly if we take the soul of sustainability as shaped by the academy and uh, yeah in the 1970s and 80s the resources for the new generation and how we relate our resources to, to theirs it is impossible to to seriously think on sustainable development unless the cultural component of those resources those cultural resources are explicitly being included because with this culture fourth pillar dimension component circle whatever uh, include are key elements for the soul of people key elements for life key elements to reach happiness key elements to unfold freedoms 
creativity, we create, we do new things, we share heritage, we challenge heritage, especially that that heritage that prevents human beings for from having full dignity. We learn from diversity, we share knowledge, and dear colleagues, these considerations are not, have never been in the equation of sustainable development. This is not, they are not in UN High Level Political Forum, UN DESA, European Union, uh, the main players. It is not there. Those considerations are not there. But they are in the human rights frames. Uh, 1966, the Universal uh, Covenant uh, on Civil and Political Rights, explicit mention of the place of culture, and especially the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. I repeat, International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, Article 15.1, everybody has the right to fully participate in cultural life. Uh, we in UCLG, we try to build our policies around the concept of, uh, yeah, human rights based approach to development. And we consider quite normal that we build our programs and policies on, on this 15.1. And we find that this metaphor, the metaphor of the fourth pillar, Probably not not the best metaphor, eh? because it's fourth, uh, fourth according to what? Fourth uh, hierarchy, of course not, but you have to explain. Uh, pillar, pillarization, sectorialization, difficult because we all want to be transversal, etc. But anyway, it is a metaphor and it is also provocation because let me add the second component uh, in, my, in my talk. We cannot forget that we are in a world that is run by ours, ours. And culture, we have to recognize, it has always been an element to sustain, maintain, ensure the continuity of political and economic powers. Nation states in the 19th century and even before, they were based on this assumption. 20th century is the continuation of most of national cultural institutions being built to warranty that there is a continuity in the holding of power in some specific places. And this reality uh, leaves to some extent uncomfortably with the human rights-based narrative, uh, which is based on leave no one behind, leave no place behind. This is something that the cultural sector has not addressed in an explicit way. And we are not addressing this, this uh, uh, process accurately, this reality accurately. Uh, the third thing I would like to, to share with you, uh, and now I'm turning to the, uh, say, uh, explanation of the 2030 goal uh, campaign. Um, we believed uh, in 2012, uh, even before in 2011, even before in 2010, when we passed our declaration, culture is the fourth pillar of sustainable development. We wanted this narrative to be somehow discussed in the Rio plus 20, in Rio de Janeiro in 2012. Uh, we organized with the government of Brazil uh, a seminar on this issue. Footnote, uh, to illustrate this question of power. Today, we could not have organized such a seminar with the government of Brazil. With the Brazil of 2012, uh, let me be explicit, with the presidency of Lula, we were able to put this uh, seminar in the site events agenda of Rio plus 20. Today, impossible. And you, you all know why. Uh, so we we managed to organize a site event in, in 2012. We prepared for the day, for the year after uh, the Hangzhou conference 
organized by UNESCO and China on culture and sustainable development. It was meant, the Hangzhou conference meant to prepare the contribution of UNESCO to the new generation of goals, the post-2015 uh, development agenda. At that time, it was not yet called the Agenda 2030. The SDGs were not known as uh, they were uh, they were approved in 2015. But anyway, we went to that conference with a clear uh, advocacy element. We want a goal. We believe this is the way that the power is recognized. Power meaning the place of cultural actors in international in the international conversation on development, in national delivery of policies, in local localization, in local democracy. Very easy. Uh, to our surprise, UNESCO and, and, and the government of the People's Republic of China accepted uh, that paragraph. And if you look at the Hangzhou Declaration, it says in its final paragraph, we would like there is a goal on culture uh, based on creativity, heritage, diversity, and the transmission of knowledge. Immediately after uh, that uh, approval, uh, in June, we discovered that uh, this narrative was, was not defended in the places where the SDGs uh, were being discussed. And thinking in our uh, children and grandchildren, and to be coherent with our advocacy, we decided to write how a culture goal would look like. And this is why we published in September 2013 a document, Culture as a Goal, with a clear language for the goal, ensure uh, cultural sustainability for all, and 10 targets. The campaign had a very limited impact. Uh, within UNESCO and in member states, which are the, the main players in deciding what is a goal and, and what are the goals, what are the targets, etc. Uh, basically, because we are weak, we, meaning uh, the civil society that wrote that document, the International Federation of Libraries, ICOMOS, International Council of, Monu of Monuments and Sites, International Music Council and the Federation of Coalitions for Cultural Diversity, together with Culture Action Europe, Arterial Network, and us. And at that point, IFCA was also signing that, that document. Um, we, we are weak. We, we are not as Greenpeace or Human Rights Watch or uh, other big organizations with delegations in, in New York uh, with capacity to follow up, to know uh, the ambassadors and to, to negotiate with them uh, on wording, on, on uh, well, also because some of the states thought this was a bad, a bad idea. Some of them, because they, they believe that uh, defending culture as a goal could give uh, more uh, legitimacy to autocracies. Uh, some because say it is, it is difficult to find indicators. We believe that this is not true because the work done by the Academy and by UNESCO with the indicators uh, on culture is, is at least as uh, mature as indicators in gender equality or education or social inclusion. Uh, so it's not a matter of indicator, indicators, it's something else. The campaign has evolved. We published several documents, three more in the run to the approval of the SDGs, including the document we published uh, on the day the SDGs were approved, saying progress made, but substantial challenges remain ahead. Uh, we published in 2019 and 2021 two thick reports analyzing what the states are uh, explaining to the UN with their voluntary national reviews and what the cities are doing with the SDGs in their voluntary national uh, local reviews. We, of course, found that some very few countries are uh, using or including culture in the delivery uh, to achieve nationally the SDGs, and that cities are taking this, say, more in-depth, more cities and more in-depth work by cities involving uh, cultural organizations to, to a great extent, community centers, heritage, 
libraries, of course, festivals, etc. Um, and in order to prepare Mondia Kult, we agreed to repeat the exercise and to write again, taking into consideration that almost 10 years had passed, uh, taking into consideration our common agenda report by the UN Secretary General Guterres last September, and taking into account the preparations of the Summit of the Future to happen in September 2023, we thought it's not a bad idea to write again uh, a new document, Culture as a Goal. And this is what we have done. The document is finished. We are going to release it on the 27th of September at, at two o'clock uh, Mexico City time, uh, the day before Mondiacult opens. And in Mondiacult, we also have half an hour to explain that document and we hope we will be able to attract to that moment, uh, to that event, uh, ministers. Ministers, because we need champions. Of course, we need champions. We need some states to say, yes, this is feasible. Yes, we believe in that. Yes, this is uh, very dear to our development and we will support this. Uh, I will finish by saying, uh, please, uh, it cannot be just uh, approaching the ministers. It cannot be uh, sharing this document with UNESCO, which, by the way, uh, uh, considering the drafts we have been able to, to read of the final outcome document of the declaration of Mondia Cult, the wording on this need for a goal is not as good as it could be. So it's not just the member states, it's not UNESCO, it's it's also the it's also you. It's also the, the capacity of civil society to make noise, to 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 phone your local councillor for culture, your national minister for culture, and, and say this is something that we need. This is something that we need. We are under equipped to work with other organizations in the delivery of, of real endogenous human rights based development. We need to be uh, sitting at the table with the other actors. And if we are just mentioned tangentially, indirectly, uh, to serve other goals, the freedoms, uh, the cultural capacities, the work that we do uh, is uh, unbalanced, is uh, unsure. Uh, so I would like to finish with uh, inviting you to, to discuss, uh, of course, to analyze, to be critical to what this campaign is doing, in which we, UCLG, we are uh, one fraction of it, uh, but also to, to support uh, the, the idea, to, to, to struggle and to, to carry on with, with your work. And yeah, I think that's, that's all for the first, the first round, Pedro. Thank you very much, Jordi. Uh, I will ask you one question to warm up the audience. You've mentioned that you naturally need to champion this discussion through ministry, through uh, people who will kind of advocate and help you to deliver the message about the campaign. But you also said, uh, you also mentioned that it's very important that us as audience, as us, as the cultural sector, also pressure, also create somehow a critical mass to move the campaign forward, to advocate for it, to talk about the importance of culture included as one component, uh, as you said, or no matter the name, but as a, a more concrete uh, goal. And I want to know which advice could you give to, for instance, one participant of us who is in Uganda or in Italy or in China, how can this person uh, approach uh, one institution? Because you also mentioned you are uh, UCLG. It's uh, one institution among other institutions. So how do you, which advice do you offer for somebody who wants to, to take part and to kind of uh, embrace the cause as well? A bit difficult to have the, the complete map, but... Uh... 
probably the best way is through through the existing networks uh, because we in the cultural sector we work uh, very often with sectors and subsectors uh, architects uh, screen players actors actresses um, designers uh, conservators um, there is for sure an, an association or a federation in your country that uh, represents your interests at national level so make sure that they they know what what this campaign is doing uh, and then try to convince that this uh, national actor is active internationally there are federations and, and and forums councils global councils like i said the international music council is a member of of the campaign or the international council on monuments and sites ecom the international council of museums is not yet a member of the campaign but there are everywhere national delegations of uh, icom um this this could be the advice and of course there are other say less formalized networks those that are more related to 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 the digital creation uh process uh, those that are more related to the to the uh, grassroots activism with cultural centers and and fab labs and uh all these um but uh, i could i would recommend to to connect with with those entities a second question from my side trying to connect with what anupama has presented and violeta as well it seems, and please correct me if you understand it in, in a different way, that many policies recently, they have focused on the economic power of culture, instrumentalize it through the cultural and creative industries or creative economy ideas. And there is, an, from my perspective, an excessive positivism uh in the cultural sector to prove itself mathematically through numbers to prove the contribution to gdps to jobs creations and income generation etc 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 and in a way i i i i think this has kind of uh covered the other perspectives the, the 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 innate values of culture and the values that are interconnected with other uh sectors as well so we tend to see culture in many countries many developing countries tend to see culture and through the creative industry lenses so they start supporting they start financing activity as long as these activities will create an economic benefit so i wanted to hear from you if you think this has brought if this is if you understand it in a similar way and secondly if this has brought a kind of negative effect to the inclusion of culture uh, as one of the sdgs uh, goals Pedro, what a wonderful question. Um, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. The, the trend has been, it existed, and it has been certainly damaging the possibilities of a culture goal. And it has disempowered uh, people. Let me put it this way. It has disempowered people. It has... uh say turned citizens into consumers you count because you visit a museum you count because you take a flight and you become a tourist you count because you have, you are a subscriber to netflix uh or to hbo etc uh let me let me explain a bit 
uh, and also be a bit critical and also make a call to, to some of you that are researching in the university that the mantra that uh, many instances related to UNESCO uh, is uh, using to explain the evolution of the cultural and development debate in the last 40 years uh, needs to be challenged. This mantra is as if there was a linear evolution from the 1980s to our days, from the Mondia cult or from the today 50 years of the Convention on uh, Natural and Cultural Heritage passing uh, through Mondia cult 1982, and then the decade on cultural development and the Perez de Cuellar report, the Stockholm conference, and then the two convent, the convention on, on the Declaration on Cultural Diversity in 2001, the, the Convention on Cultural Diversity in 2005, until today. Uh, no, excuse me, no, this is not true, not accurate. If you read the uh, conclusions of the Perez de Cuellar uh, report, the Our Creative Diversity Report in 1985, 1995, excuse me, 1995, five out of 10 of the main recommendations were related to cultural rights. How? But of course, most of the states find it too difficult to implement those uh, uh, recommendations. Too difficult because they were challenging power and they were human rights based. And at that point, 19, mid 1980s, the struggle between uh, purely economic globalization and globalization with a human face was taking place. We all know who won that battle. And the international co conversation on cultural development uh, had an inflection point in 1998-1999 when the World Bank with UNESCO organized the conference Culture Counts. What else can we say? Culture Counts, 1999. And, and then the agenda is, say, the agenda of cultural actors, official cultural actors, is taken by the instrumentalization of culture. Uh, even the Convention on Cultural Diversity, the article that relates culture to sustainable development in that, in that convention is awfully biased towards the instrumentalization of culture for sustainable development in economic terms. Slowly, uh, in the last decade, because of the existence of the UN Special Rapporteur on Cultural Rights, because of the work we have done in United States and local governments, because of mm, some actors uh, more aware of the need to consider culture as a, yes, as a global public good, as a public good, as, as a field that is related to freedoms, as education, as health, as social services. Uh, I can I, I believe that we are reversing the situation. Uh, frankly, the, the, the fact that Mondia Cult is promoting the idea uh, of culture as a global public good is 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 good. But um, excuse me, in the 1980s we had arrived uh, farther, and it's not such a new idea. Uh, we understand the real politic and the last 20 years of globalization without a human face uh, has brought us to the, say more to the beginning of the race. We understand, but do not tell us that uh, this is big progress because uh, it is not. Uh, and to conclude, I think that one of the champions of this idea that, that uh, the relation between uh, say development and culture is uh, should go through economic uh, use of culture. Uh, Richard Florida, he he already said that his ideas of trickling down the say the the income of the creative class um, 
is not working well. Uh, you, you, you need political frames. You need power to uh, to support uh, cultural rights. You know, uh, you, 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 it is it is quite evident that unless you have uh, a vibrant, very active civil society, committed, empowered. Uh, cultural capacities for all cannot progress and of course culture has a cultural a, a, an economic dimension and of course this is an important issue but it cannot be the central issue of cultural policies uh, we will see the evolution in the in the following in the following years but yeah not easy but a nice battle to to undertake Thank you, Jordi. We will get two more questions before we close our session. Uh, there is one question addressed uh, to you, I believe, from Mihaela Klinku. She's from Casta Morelli Cultural Association from Yazi, Romania. And she said that she's following the culture and the sustainable development, both as practitioner and theoretical level. Thank you for your inputs and endeavor in bringing this complementary on this priorities table. I have a question regarding the cities that you mentioned that embraced the culture and the SDGs. Are this information public? Where could we find it? Very good question. Thank you very much, Maya. Thank you very much for this, for this question. For example, here. Uh, I just copied and pasted a link uh, from our website. Uh, in our website, there is uh, great information on culture and the SDGs, on, on how some cities uh, around the world uh, have worked with us uh, building uh, cultural rights-based uh, plans. Uh, Mexico City, Barcelona, Concepcion, Jeju, uh, Bulawayo, uh, Montreal, to mention cities in, in several continents. And one of the programs that we there uh, is this seven keys. With the seven keys, we, we uh, convene local meetings between cultural actors, the uh, local government, also academics, and, and, and practitioners and people working in other, in other areas, not, not only culture. And we analyze the SDGs, we analyze the cultural resources of the place, and we come with seven keys, seven ideas, seven uh, commitments that the city uh, and the participants to the workshop uh, commit to unfold during the next, the next years. Of course, they are unique, only, only applicable uh, to one place. Um, it's a nice way to say, um, share the difficulties of the SDGs, but also turn them around and use them, use them to, to make the cultural dimension of development stronger. And also by doing this, making the cultural actors more connected, more in the interdependent with other, uh, local actors related to development. Thank you, Jordi. And now we come to the last question of the day. I have seen that Anupama has already written an answer to this question, but as this question came to all panelists, I would like to, 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 to open it. It comes from Mimeli Halanze, who is also a participant uh, in, in, in our program. He comes from Exwatini. Uh, and he wrote, thank you for the presentations very captivating we speak of the promotion of the creative industries but do you think uh, uh, that enough is being done to capacitate cultural practitioners on intellectual property rights so as to adequately protect the intellectual property and fully realize the monetization that emanates from that especially considering how the global south has been on disadvantage and of the infringement of their intellectual property historically. The question goes to any 
of the panelists. And then Anupam, I will read your answer if you allow me. And she wrote, yes, this is a huge problem in the global south. Even in countries where uh, policy exists to support IP, implementation is so poor. In Bangladesh, musicians themselves have stepped up to solve the problem to an industry body. And then she sent the link. I don't know if Jordi or Violeta, who would like to start with this one? about capacitation on intellectual property rights? I, I don't have the capacity to answer that question. Uh, it's it's not in the in the knowledge I have and I would say obvious or wrong things. So I, I prefer not not to address that question. I'm sorry. I'm I'm limited. Um, I'm uh, happy to make a comment. Uh, it's my personal comment. It will be more political one. But I think uh, with the emerging new awareness that is happening on a global scale, uh, the concept of intellectual rights will have to be rewritten. Uh, it was very much a tool uh, for the rich. Uh, and uh, it's um, a lot of things, uh, especially the uh, artists and not only artists, but also entrepreneurs from poorer countries uh, lost because they didn't have capacity, knowledge, money in order to protect whatever they uh, owned. So um, that is the first answer. We, we have to dig into this very uh, difficult topic and especially probably on the UN level. So I'm very much uh, inviting Anup <laughs> Anupama to uh, to get involved in that and you as well, uh, Jordi, uh, because um, the way how uh, the ownership uh, has been defined in the industrial age was very much influenced by imperialistic models. So um, if we want really a truly emergent uh, sort of um, equal opportunity world, um, this will have to be done in a much more distributed, non-centralized um, uh, way. And uh, I would even claim that this should not be charged for. If we are really a modern and open society, uh, to, to be able to protect who you are and what you are, and that uh, uh, we can go down to your personality because you are uh, an incredible, we are an incredible creations and, and an incredible uh, uh, sort of unique uh, uh, beings. So uh, in a digital world, this is becoming very apparent that uh, this uh, somehow is they're trying to make yet another commodity. So again, uh, I would I don't have a precise answers, but I'm just sharing some thoughts that are emerging out of our discussions within eco civilization. Uh, and especially uh, within the uh, digital community that is part of that as well, Kodu community, uh, where uh, they are now developing a completely new concept of distributed um, uh, open source uh, social frameworks within which uh, a new definitions and rules uh, of more democratic and inclusive nation could be developed. But certainly I'm welcoming everyone and I'm inviting everyone, please keep debating this. Don't take for granted old rules because they are not serving uh, an emerging uh, open inclusive world. Thank you, Violeta. Uh, just a quick comment on this question. I think my personal answer is somebody who has been working on this topic as well in multiple countries around mainly Latin America and sometimes in Sub-Saharan Africa is there is not enough capacity building, especially uh, when it comes to agencies which should be dealing with copyrights, right? Government bodies and even private agencies uh, in different countries or transnational once usually when there is a new production either a video game production or a new song if this new product or new invention is not resisted somewhere else in europe it's very likely that piracy will take uh, and you won't be able to enjoy the lasting rights that you have through copyright so not enough has been done there 
few few movements, few initiatives uh, from UNESCO through the expert facility uh, from UNCTAD, the institution where I've been working quite a lot, and some other bodies related to copyrights, but it's still much more to be done. Uh, fighting against my Brazilian legacy of being always late, I would like to come to the final remarks of our session. And before that, I would like to, to, to mention that Violeta and Anupama's presentation will be shared with all the participants. And I'm pretty sure that Jordi as well, it's very open to keep in touch. You will be able to find their names online on LinkedIn and also their email address through the websites you will be probably finding on their slide presentations. So feel free to get in touch with them directly if you have any more questions and any other comments to be done. Uh, we hope to have covered most of the questions we have been uh, receiving here. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the, the speakers, they endeavor to answer all the questions. I see that they are still answering questions at this point. So many thanks for, for the three of you, uh, Violeta, Anupama and Jordi. Great, great, great contribution. It's not every day that we are able to have three wonderful panelists with a critical thinking mainly. So I would like to appreciate your transparency, your, your honesty to go to, 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 to straight to critical points. Uh, I would also uh, like to, to remember that, that this project is funded by the European Union through the cultural relations platform and hosted by the nonprofit organization Culture and Sustainability Lab. This residence program uh, of this project, it's organized uh, with the kind support and collaboration of the Austrian Cultural Forum in Istanbul, where we will be very soon. Uh, and that the project team uh, here with us, it's comprised of alumni of the EU funded Global Cultural Relations Platform uh, program from 2021. Uh, here we have Alexandra, uh, from Slovenia, we have Pravali from India, and we have Sedi Kamal from Uzbekistan, uh, and I'm Pedro from Brazil slash uh, Berlin, Germany, and we also have another colleague of us who I don't think it's with us today because of uh, time zone, very likely, if I'm not wrong. I think Sheila is here behind one of our other accounts, but Sheila's from Indonesia, and our participants have had, you know, pleasure of meeting her already in our previous session, but uh, she's our communications task force. Thank you, Pravali. So we will be meeting each other before everybody leave next week on Tuesday. Uh, next week, uh, also uh, from here on Zoom, from two to three fifteen. This will be a shorter. A, ver a version of our session uh, with Miss Yulia Laguzieri. She's the co-founder of Opera for Peace, and then Miss Anaïs Rosen. Uh, she's we, she, she's from Education and Sustainability Initiative uh, from Spain. So I hope to see you all next week. I hope also you have enjoyed. This afternoon, thank you for all the participants, for the questions, for the input and insights, and to the three panelists, uh, round of applause to everybody, and hope to see you very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.